you are some beautiful humans. And I'm saying that through a really strong lie. So I'm probably not seeing you real good, but you're still really beautiful. I'm just telling you. Hey, I've got to share something to you. When we were in worship today, and I'm going to apologize to the video guy in the back, because if I stand in one place, I don't even know if I'll dribble out of my mouth. I'll just move. Um, when we were in worship today, um, God brought this scripture up in my heart. It was Matthew 24, 12. And it's the love of many will grow cold. And um, I, just, I just felt such sorrow in the heart of God for love growing cold. And then I saw as we were praising him, I saw Jesus just lifted up. And I saw him start to get really big around our house. And, and, and I felt his heart being pulled by the love that we were expressing in worship. And I saw his arms just start to wrap around us and just love on us as we were loving on him. And I just felt a stirring in the spirit. I felt it was almost like a cry in the spirit that was crying out. It was, it was, it was like a warrior cry, but it was a warrior love cry. And it was like the, 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 the spirit of this house, the, the heart of this house, would not let the love of God grow cold in our community. And I just want to begin to praise God and thank him that we have a church and a body of people that say, no, we will not grow cold in our love. We will stir up the love of God because how can, how can the lost come to know the goodness of God if the body of Christ, his church, is not reaching out from the very heart of God themselves? And man, that's kind of what I'm talking about about today. And I'll tell you what, um, probably about, so bless God, man, it's good to be here. My name is Blake. Uh, <laughs> uh, I am so honored, man. It's, it's, it's such a special, it's a special blessing to get to minister with your family. You know what I'm saying? Um, and so, like, to be able to minister here at home um, is, is beyond beautiful. And so I'm just richly blessed. I trust that you are going to be richly blessed. I pray the scripture um, um, that, you know, when Jesus and, and he was walking with his disciples, I guess this is them walking, on the road to Emmaus, <laughs> um, they didn't recognize Jesus. Uh, but then he broke bread and he was like, Whoa! And they were like, oh, Jesus. It was like, oh, Jesus. No, it was really like, oh, Jesus, you know. Um, come over here. Um, and they were like, we knew. We knew there was something different about the words that you were saying because the wor our hearts burned at your words. And so my prayers was we get into the word of God. As you, I pray that every time you pick up the word of God, that your heart burns. And I just release that over us, that our hearts would just burn with the, when the word of God is opened for us in our private time, in our public time, any time we are in, in any kind of need, that that word would begin to stir. Man, God is good. And so, I, again, I'm honored to be here. I'm going to get right into it. And, and my hope today is that God is just lifted high and that the love of many is stirred. Hallelujah. Um, and, and my, the title of my mes message is Overt Love covert evangelism. Um, and, and just to give you a couple of uh, definitions, because everybody loves PowerPoint definitions. I haven't ever met one person who's like, I don't like PowerPoint definitions. <laughs> okay, that might be a stretching of the truth, but still, sometimes it's good to see it in front of you, right? Overt, done or shown openly, plainly or readily apparent, not secret or hidden. Covert, undercover, stealthy, like a ninja. So right now, I just want you to imagine yourselves as Jesus ninjas, all right? Instead of throwing stars, because I could kill somebody. We don't want to kill anybody, Farrell. Um, you, have, you have Holy Ghost Bibles. So that's kind of a sword, so I'm just going to move on from that point. Um, but what, what I wanted to really get into is, um, is overt love to start with. And then we're just going to kind of begin to move into the covert. Um, because here's the thing is that how many of us sitting here, I want you to raise your hand on this. How many of you are a paid pastor on staff at a church? Please look around. Oh, dear me. How can anyone be saved? Because we all know the only way someone gets saved is if they come to church and they hear a message. Oh, oh, but, but, but we don't even have a pastor here today. How can someone carry the message of God? I'm going to step out here, and I'm going to say, 
It takes more than just pastors proclaiming the goodness of God for the world to hear the message of Jesus. Now, come on for just a second. When I was, I was uh, my, great, my great-grandpa and my grandpa were both pastors. And so, like, I grew up underneath a church pew. Uh, and that's just what it was. Uh, and, and let's not get too spiritual. A lot of times when I was little, it was with Hot Wheels cars and model tractors, okay? That's how I grew up. In the, but, you know, <laughs> but, but I, think, I think my grandparents are just like, hopefully, you know, like some of the anointing would just, just, just slough off on him uh, while he's playing with his Hot Wheels cars. Um, thank you. <laughs> Um, and I struggled with something because I really felt a call to, to preach the word. But um, I also felt a call into the marketplace. Do you guys get that? The marketplace, where we do life, where we have our jobs, where we live, where we, where we, where we go to places of business. And so I, I, I've had this constant struggle about when I do ministry, it has to be here. And that outside of here, it's not really ministry. That there are these lines that separate what is sacred, what is holy, and what is secular. And see, here's the thing that that God has been breaking my heart about is there is no line. That, that for so many years, there has been this, this push that, that, to, to, to elevate. Now, here's the thing is that the ministry is the fivefold ministry, and Linda preached on the last Sunday, and it's so valid, and it's so poignant, and it's so necessary. But see, here's the thing is that is not the only people who are called to be ministers. We are all called to carry the love and the hope and the glory of the kingdom every single place we go, church. And see, here's the thing, is that for years, the the church has, we've done a bad job. I'm just going to say it, because what's happened is we've built these, we've built these walls where, and set up these systems where it's us and it's them. Now, this is not everybody, but I'm just saying, this is what's happened. And there's become this separation between the world and the church, And see, here's what happens. Anytime you set up a situation where there is an us and there is a them, 98, 99% of the time, you are going to put yourself in the position of elevation. And anytime you put yourself in a position of elevation, those people around you feel that. And that's why when you talk to an unbeliever about the church, they feel judgment. That's why they feel hypocrisy because they see these people elevating themselves and pulling out from the, from, from the world to a point where they feel like they're saying, we are better than you. We want you to have what we have because it's better and if you don't accept it, we're done with you. Now, here's the, here's the thing. I believe that part of my life, and I think sometimes in the church, we do the New Testament under the Old Testament anointing. Let me, tell, let, me, let, me, let me talk to you about what I'm saying. There's this thing in the world where, where it talks about, where, where people will say, oh, you'll be known by the company you keep. Now, I think that there can be some wisdom in that, but here's, here is the thing, child of God, is that in the Old Testament, if you touched a leper, you became dirty. You were in danger of having leprosy and you had to go wash off, right? In the New Testament, what happens to the leper? The leper comes to you, you touch them, and they become clean. Now, come on, church. That is the way Jesus did life. Jesus did not do life by pulling himself away from the world. Jesus did life by putting himself smack dab in the company of sinners, which we all are, hallelujah, which we all have been, praise God. If not for the grace of God, where would we be? If not for the love of God, where would we be? But see, church, any time that we start thinking, "Mm, come on now. And hey, I want you to know, I'm preaching to me as much as you, and this is, hey, listen, one of the things that God has started to do to me is the religious and political spirits that try to rule and govern me, he's trying to trample all over them. 
Come on. And it, I'm just going to tell you, it gets uncomfortable because you know what? This is what I found out is sometimes I like my religion. Do you know why? Because it's safe, it's comfortable, and there is no risk. But man, as the Holy Spirit was speaking today, as we lean into God, as we step out on the water, you cannot get away from risk in the kingdom. And that is a glorious, beautiful thing. Because where can you go that God's love cannot find you? There is no risk he can send you to that he will not provide provision for. Come on now, get a hold of that. There's some of you that are setting on some dreams and setting on some stirrings of the Holy Spirit that you have not stepped out of because you've got a good pros and cons list and the cons outbalance the pros, but God is saying, put the pros and cons list in the garbage and step out into my provision. Let yourself see the goodness of God. Let yourself see the hand of the king on your life. Oh man, that's a good word. I'm gonna write that one down. Preaching to me there. Whoo, Jesus. I tell you what, let's get into a scripture. <laughs> uh, if you would, I'm going to go to 1 John chapter 4. And I'm just going to tell you something. Um, for about a, I don't know. <laughs> let's just put years. <laughs> I'm not going to quantify it with a number. For years, God's been kind of messing with my, my brain. Um, about two and a half years ago, I prayed something to God. Sometimes, Ms. K, when you, pray, when you pray something to God, God surprisingly answers. I say surprisingly in a joking sense because sometimes when I'm praying, I'm really not expecting the answer. But you know what? God is so good that he is going to answer you when you talk to him. Because what kind of daddy, when you ask for a fish, gives you a stone? Not our daddy. Our daddy is good. When you talk to daddy, daddy is going to talk back to you. Come on now. We're going into 1 John, and, and there's this scripture in 1 John, and I'm going to skip down to it. Well, I'll start here. Beloved, let us love one another. I could probably be done today. I could just say, Holy Spirit, work on that. I'm going to go sit down and drink some water, maybe have a donut, do what you do. But my clock timer is still counting, so I got to keep talking. Um, for love is from God. Come on now. At the, here's the thing. Here's the thing is that our God is love. That's what he is. You cannot separate love and God because without God there isn't love. Hmm. God started. Okay. In this, verse 9, in this the love of God was made manifest among us that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. John 3, 16, that's not on my slides. I'm just gonna tell it to you. You guys know it though. For God so loved the world, he did what? He gave his only begotten son. Now I want you to look back to the first part. For God so loved the world. Now does God love the church? Somebody say amen. Amen, amen. he loves us with a passion. And he loves the world with a passion. He gave his son for the world because when his son was given, this concept of the church, was it there? Okay, now here's the thing. If God sacrificed his son for the world because of love, how am I viewing the world? How am I looking at the world? And let's get real. Let's get personal. How am I looking at the coworker that drives me nuts? How am I looking at the family member that, by God, they got what they deserved? How am I looking at the world? Because, see, this is what God keeps wrecking me with. Every time I have a little snide, snarky, judgmental comment, and I get them, whew, bless God, I don't have any problem with that. Every time I have one of those, God keeps, God keeps reminding me that that's the person that he died for. That's the person he bled out for. That's the person that he said, hit me again and put, some, put something on it. That's the one that he said, Father, forgive them. Man, that wrecks my brain. 
Do you know what I'm saying? That means that that person that's rude, that's arrogant, that's puffed up, that's, and I'm not just talking about me, right? No, that's, that's all of these things. God loves them so much. God loves them ferociously. And you know what? Just because they're entertaining this spirit or that spirit and they're putting on, we don't know the hurt they're coming at us with and they're putting on that mad and that angry face and they're setting in that stinking thinking and that poverty mentality. It doesn't just give us a, oh, we can just cast them out. Done with them. Did you see the way they looked at me? Curl their nose at me. Go on with your bad self. Come on now. Now here's the truth sometimes. Sometimes, sometimes, I'm telling you what, sometimes somebody can just, do, some just look at us wrong and we write them off. Is that not true? And they're like, that's, uh, Blake, what are you, huh? That's what I think sometimes. Blake, what are you, huh? Hey, jump down to verse 17 with me. Because watch this. This is the thing that I love about daddy. Is daddy is all about partnership. Daddy wants to partner with us. Not only to reach this world, but to bring. Now, you remember what Jesus prayed when he was praying the Lord's Prayer? He said, on earth as it is in heaven. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't think that Jesus probably just prayed frivolous things. He wasn't just like, well... Dad, if you get around to it, could you bring it here on earth like it is in heaven? No. Jesus was proclaiming the heart of God in his prayer. Because he says, he says so many times, the Father and I are one. I speak only what I hear the Father speak. And so we hear in that simple statement the heart of God that says, on earth as it is in heaven. Now this can start to wreck your mind because... God is partnering with us for that to happen. God is partnering with mankind, humanity, to bring the kingdom of heaven into this place. To bring an atmosphere where disease has no foothold. Come on now. Bringing an atmosphere where shackles and bondages fall off when they enter the room. When the dead starts to rise because of the power of the kingdom of heaven. Come on now. That's what God is partnering with us in. And look at verse 17. Well, let's look at 16. It's good too. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. Now, sometimes that's the hang up. Sometimes we don't see ourselves as worthy. Church, let me, let me just, let's just cast that off. We, I, I tell you what, grab, hold, grab hands with somebody you're sitting next to. And I just want you to say, I am worthy of the love of God. And the person next to me is worthy of the love of God and we receive that love of God in Jesus name now love on that person a little bit and give God some praise for that because that's the truth that's the truth and too often we believe a lie that says we are less than that all the time we can believe a lie that says it's less, that we are less than that. But see, here's the bottom line. And pastor is so good about this. What are we going to believe? Are we going to believe our feelings or are we going to believe the word of God? Because I'm going to tell you what, one of those two things is going to change in the next five minutes. And it's not the word of God. I'm just saying. All right, now jump on down here. Okay. God is love and whoever abides in love abides in God. just letting that soak. That's good, right? By this is love perfected with us. Did you get that? As we abide in the love of God, as we grow in our love of God and, his, and knowledge of his love for us, love is perfected. Love grows in us. And see, here's what's amazing. As our understanding of God's love for us grows and we accept that, then we have so much more to give out to the world. You know, sometimes, 
I make this statement to myself. I don't know if I have time to spend with God today. But see, here's another thing that I'm doing. I'm drawing lines around sacred and secular. I only look at the time when I'm sitting down and I'm saying, this is God's time, as the time I'm spending with God. Am I ever getting away from God by going to work or by getting in the car or going to the bathroom? No. Here's the thing, is that we are spirit beings, right? Everything is spiritual to us. When we try to start making these lines about sacred and spiritual, or secular and spiritual and non-spiritual, those are just lines that try to just mess with us. There are no lines. We are spiritual beings where everything we do has the potential to be sacred. Everything. I hear a minister say, everything you do is supernatural when you do it with God. Because he takes your natural and he puts his super with it. You guys are supernatural. Supernatural saints of God. That's not me just saying that. That's what God's heart feels for you. That's what God's heart feels for you when you're in the workplace. When you're in the car. When you're going on vacation. When you're going to the mechanic shop. When you're going to the grocery store. You are taking kingdom with you. Now, here's where it can start to get fun. Let's skip over to covert missions. <clears throat> Excuse me. Covert evangelism. Now, here's the deal, is that we're talking about overt love, but covert evangelism. Now, I know some people might be like, covert evangelism. Wait a minute. Does that mean I can't say the name of Jesus? Because that's where all the power is. No, it's not what we're saying. That's not even where I'm going to go. Of course we can say the name where there is the power, all right? Um, but I want to show you some things. Um, and this is something that God has begun to, to really reveal to me because I've worked in public education for 11 years now. And like, in public education, um, there are certain lines of law um, that are set up, right? I mean, I don't have to get real detailed and specific with that. You know where I'm tracking. Um, and so when you go into that system... There's a part of you that has to honor that because God says to honor the authorities that are over you. But see, here's the thing, is that we're gonna look at different situations in the Bible where we have men put in situations where they are serving straight up evil bros, yo, and honor them, now watch this, to the limit that their principles allow. Honoring and respecting the organization, even the head, if the head isn't holy. Now that's, no, no, bless God, I'm more of, uh, I have an Elijah spirit and I'm gonna throw stones right at that head. Now listen, listen, there is a place and a time for Elijah, right? But there's also a place and a time for Daniel. You know what I'm saying? And, and, and I'm just gonna throw this out this and you can, you can, I don't know, you can hate tweet it later. Uh, and this is a, a question I have for the church, is one of the reasons that we do not have favor in certain aspects is we've been too busy throwing stones at them. I, I'm just asking. I'm asking myself. I don't know. Maybe not, but just thinking. Now, here is, here's one of, the, one of the heart scriptures that, that, that I have as I, as I go into my job is, so be wise as serpents. Because I think any time that we are working and we are ministering in the world, that there is a wisdom aspect that we have to follow. Let's jump into the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 1. If you've got your Bibles, roll over there. Daniel 1. <laughs> Daniel 1, let's have some fun. Okay, and so here's the deal. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar. Now, <clears throat> this guy has a really cool name. Um, I promise and I have talked at length about naming our firstborn son, uh, Nebuchadnezzar. Um, she really doesn't feel it at all. Um, so that's not going to happen. But anyhow, um, <laughs> and the Lord gave the king of Judah into his hand. So we see what's happening. Uh, the land of Judah is being sacked 
by Babylonia, or the Babylons, uh, Babylonian O, <laughs> Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. I'm just playing. Uh, and so watch what happens. And some of the vessels of the house of God. And he brought them to the land of, of Shinar, to the house of his God, and placed the vessels in the treasury of his God. So we see, we see Nebuchadnezzar coming into Babylon, or coming into Judah, and sacking the town. Now wait a minute. You might say, but that's God's people. Yeah. But of course, they weren't living with God, and we had some, we had some, insta, we had some insta judgment poured out. All right? Now, if you rock on down, this is where it kind of gets really cool. It's already cool, right? Verse 3. Then the king commanded his chief eunuch to bring some of the people of Israel, both the royal family and of the nobility. Watch this. Verse 4. Youths. You guys ever seen that movie where he's like, youths? No, never mind. It's not... Stay spiritual, boy. No. Uh, youths without blemish of good appearance and skillful in all wisdom, endowed with knowledge, understanding, learning, and competent to stand in the king's palace. And watch what they're going to do to them. So they're, so they're taking all these. Nebuchadnezzar wants Israelites who are smart, handsome, competent learners. Every man's like, that's me. They would have taken me, I know. <laughs> right? Uh, <laughs> Someone's like, is that the spirit of revelation? No, oh, it's not prophecy either. Um, and competent to stand in the king's palace. And he's going to teach them the literature and the language of the Chaldeans. So what they're doing, they're taking these youths of Israel. They're going to train them in the culture and the standard of Babylon. And they're going to use them then as their puppets to control and to influence Israel still. Which, you know, as a pagan military commanding officer, it's not a bad idea. But as a holistic Christian follower of Jesus, you're like, that's evil. Yeah, and it was. Now I want to show you something. So he takes Daniel, and of course we know the three Hebrew children, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, um, and they're chosen, which this book is kind of about, Daniel and those guys. Um, and then watch this. Skip down to verse 5. The king assigned them a daily portion of the food that the king ate and of the wine that he drank. They were to be educated for three years, and at the end of that time, they were to stand before the king. So then he's, got, he, he's telling them what they're going to eat, what they're going to drink, where they're going to sleep, what they're going to think. Man, sounds like national news, doesn't it? Oh, that was, I'm sorry, backing away, backing away. Verse 8, but Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself, come on now, with the king's food or with the wine that he drank. Therefore, he asked the chief of eunuchs to allow him not to defile himself. And watch this, verse 9. And God gave Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the chief eunuchs. So here's what it is, is that Daniel is in this situation. He is honoring, he's respecting as long as his principles allow. But when that pagan king asked him to go against the very law and heart of his God, that's where he said, I cannot follow. Now watch this. I want to show you something because, see, here's the thing, is that as we are faithful to the truth in us from God, God's favor will be faithful to us. So as soon as Daniel said, you know what, king? I can't. Well, see, then the chief eunuch got it all nervous. He's like, oh, man, if, if, you, if you don't do this, I might get killed. I might be dead. And Daniel's like, just, let's just try it. Let's just try it and see. Give me 10 days. If, if I'm wasting away and, and, and whatnot, that's a different conversation. Talk about some risk, Right? I mean, like, Nebuchadnezzar, not, a, not like a wholesome dude. Like, it wouldn't have mattered to him to, like, behead the whole group of them and go find some new ones. That's right. So, Daniel just leans in. At the end of 10 days, did God let him down? No way. In fact, in fact, he looked so good, him and the three Hebrew children, the chief of the eunuch was like, man, maybe we should go on their diet. Because that's, that's the goodness of God. If we lean into him, 
he's not going to leave us high and dry, is he? He's going to be there for us. He's got our back, our front, our left, our right, and our middle. God is all about us. And so now check this out. So it goes on. Um, it goes on into chapter 2. Man, there's so much good here. Ah, oh, Jesus. All right. And, and we see like, uh, we see Nebuchadnezzar has this dream. And this dream is that, um, in fact, that, that Nebuchadnezzar is going to go mental. Uh, he's going to lose his mind for a season. And uh, Daniel is giving him the interpretation of this. And in the midst of this interpretation, he's like, I wished that this was not about you, O king, but about your enemies. Now I want you to think about that for a second. Daniel is revealing the truth of this dream to Nebuchadnezzar. He served with Nebuchadnezzar for, for now it's, it's, it's uh, multiple years, maybe some, some people say 18 years. He served under this pagan king for that long, not compromising. Now come on, that's going to wreck some paradigms right there. You mean you can serve under a pagan king and not compromise? Come on, this is OT. This is before the Holy Spirit filled and indwelt believers. And if Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego can do it then, how much more can we do it now? How much more can we impact change and cultural shift with the power of the Holy Spirit operating in us? And yet Nebuchadnezzar loves this man, this man who sacked, who sacked Israel who killed probably all of Daniel's family, who killed thousands of Jews, who killed just people everywhere, who took Daniel and, and, and submerged him in this evil pagan religion. And yet still, Daniel's heart for this man was love. That messes with me. That messes with me. Because at some point, at some point, I, I'm like Peter and I want to say, God, how many times do I have to forgive so-and-so? <laughs> Jesus wasn't like 490. <laughs> he was like, yeah. What do you mean, Jesus? How many times? Yeah, all the time. Because, see, that's what God does for us, isn't it? And how will, no <sighs> see, now here's the thing. It's how will the world know that our God is that good if they don't see it from us? See, when the world sees the body of Christ take offense and turn off their love, they think that's how God is. Because, because see, here's the thing, is that we are now the hands and feet of our Messiah we are the hands and feet of our daddy God. We are his representatives in this earth. And so how we go and we present ourselves and how we love is what the world then says, that's how God loves. But see, here's the thing. <laughs> it's I mess up all the time. I shut my love off. My love gets blocked. I get offended. I get aggravated. Now, here's the thing is that those are all choices I'm making. I'm making those because they're a choice. Someone can give us offense, but we don't have to take it. Someone can be insulted, but we don't have to turn off our love towards them. Now, here's the thing. I'm not saying, I'm not saying we don't establish healthy boundaries where we're being, if we're being hurt or we're being abused or in some situation like that, we don't separate from that and we set up boundaries that keep us safe. But I believe in my heart that the very thing, the only thing that can save this world, we have. And that's Jesus and his love, and his compassion, and his life, and his kingdom. Church, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It is right before us, within us, around us. And you are 
you are walking in it and taking it places. Because see, here's the thing, is that Jesus said you are the light of the world, right? When Jesus came into you, your light went on. Your light's on. You are on to the unbelievers around you. You're on, but I, but, but, but. And see, then this is what happens is we start to think of all the things that disqualifies our light from being on. But see, there's, here's the bottom line. It doesn't matter what, how big the list of disqualifications that the enemy tries to lie to you and pile up for you. Every single, it could be a list a mile high. But see, here's the thing. The thing that qualifies you trumps that. And it's not even close. The thing that qualifies you as a believer of the child of God is the shed blood of Jesus. And nothing, nothing disqualifies that. You're on, church. You're on. You are full of love. You are full of compassion. You are full of life. You are a light in dark places. You are the salt of the earth. You are the leaven that makes, that is needed into the marketplace, that is put into the marketplace so the kingdom of heaven rises in that place. You are the transformation tool in your school, in your workplace, in your home. You are what brings kingdom there. That's what you are. That is your identity. That is truth about you. And it's founded in the word. If something tells you that you are not that, I say, I don't have time for you because that's not my identity. That's not who I am. By Daniel chapter six, Daniel had served under various pagan kings for 60 to 70 years. There was a decree that went out that you could not worship anyone other than King Darius. It was a decree aimed specifically to attack Daniel. The morning after the decree was made, he opened up his windows, he bowed down, and he worshiped the living God, the one true God. Now this is after almost 70 years of serving in a culture that is counter to the kingdom of heaven, and yet he was undefiled. He was not shaken in his principles and what he knew was truth. He was thrown into the lion's den. And though those lions might have been hungry and wanted to rip him apart, not a hair on his ancient head was touched. Come on now. The king whom Daniel had honored and served so much, he actually fasted and prayed the night before. That is a pagan king being impacted by the love of a servant of the king to the point that he's fasting and praying for his life. He runs. The scripture doesn't say he strolled down there. He ran down to the lion's den. He rolled the stone away and he ran in there or he called down and he was like, oh great king, I have survived. Church, I have, I'm getting excited about what God is releasing in our area, in our workplaces, in our homes. And so as we close today, I just want to release an impartation. Holy Spirit, we just release right now in the name of Jesus. We release, oh Father, power of the Holy Spirit, power of love and honor God, Lord Jesus. And Father, we just begin to pray for cultural transformation, for cities changing, from towns changing, from workplaces changing. And God, I pray that you anoint. Lord, Father, they're already anointed. They're already there. These people that are already stationed in the marketplaces, in in the schools, God. Father, just move and use them. I pray for just an increase in favor with God and with man for you. I pray for an increase of increase of favor, Lord God, with decision makers. That the wisdom, the wisdom of the kingdom through you is going to come on now. It's going to change organizations as they come to you asking for what should be done. Father, I pray for strategies and I release strategies in the marketplace that you would give them, that you would give believers paths that circumvent the evil and the pagan and proclaim kingdom in all places around, Lord Jesus, in all cities. 
I pray for government leaders right now. We release an anointing over them. Just the Lord Father to save them, to consecrate them, to surround them with Christian leaders that proclaim the standard of heaven in their ear, that they would not have pagan influences pouring into their ears, but that covertly you would station Christian wisdom, God, to pour into that. Oh, Jesus, and I pray, I say in Jesus' name, on earth as it is in heaven. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Ministry team, will you come up front? Hey, if you do not know Jesus as your personal Savior, and you're like, who's this dude been talking about? This Jesus. I want to encourage you. Come up here. These are men and women that want to pray for you. If you have any needs, if you have health needs, if you have physical needs, if you have other needs that you want prayer for, these people will take the time and they will pray with you and they want to. That's their heart. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. We love you. Have a beautiful Sunday and a powerful Monday. Hallelujah.